Hello, and welcome to my virtual lecture recital. My name is Kayla Roche, and I am a doctoral candidate at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. I would like to give special thanks to Mimi Fulmer for supporting me through the preparation of this recital, and my doctoral committee, including Martha Fisher, Julia Rottmeyer, and David Crook, for reading my final project and offering insight on my research. Finally, I'd like to give thanks to David Alcorn for his audio and video engineering, which is making this recital look and sound the best it can. My research focuses on art music in Iceland during the nationalist period, which was the late 19th century to the early 20th century, and specifically focuses on the voice repertoire by composer Jón Leifs. The music of Iceland is largely underperformed by non-natives due to many circumstances, such as lack of music publishing and perhaps lack of knowledge in the language. I have found that the music of Jón Leifs is suitable for singers at a variety of levels of ability, and this lecture recital, in combination with my written final project, is meant to serve as a handbook of sorts for singers to gain knowledge on the history of Icelandic music, the history of the composers, and the diction rules required for learning a piece in Icelandic. As part of my research, I have provided the International Phonetic Alphabet transcription of five of Jón's songs for voice and piano as well as a word-for-word -word and vernacular translation of the poems. Before continuing, I'd like to point out that in Iceland, people are named using the patronymic system. This means that a person's last name is a combination of their father's first name plus son, if they're a boy, or dotir, if they're a girl. As a result, people's last names are not as identifying as their first names. So following the Icelandic traditions of um, referencing people by their first names, I will use that in today's recital. I became interested in Icelandic voice repertoire after I took a trip to Iceland in 2018. I don't have a personal hereditary connection to the country, but I became very curious about the lives of Icelanders and how music plays a role in their lives during my visit. I was able to attend a concert by soprano Ellen Friedis Martin, which featured a small ensemble of viola, cello, accordion, and percussion, as well as voice. This is a very unique combination, which worked really well. I enjoyed every moment of it and was inspired to learn more. They performed original arrangements of traditional Icelandic folk songs during this concert, and I was immediately drawn to the language and the culture and the traditions, um, and I even requested some of their music. My goal today and through my research is to bring more awareness to Icelandic music and to provide a resource for learning musical traditions, pronunciation and translations of Icelandic music. To begin today, I'd like to start with a historical overview of music in Iceland. Soon after people began settling in Iceland in the year 870, music and storytelling became an integral part of their lives. In 1380, Iceland and Norway became unionized with Denmark, and this began a time of repression and tragedy for Icelanders. After gaining independence, though, from Denmark in 1944, Icelanders began to find their national identity and who they are as a country. This coincides with the nationalism period of the late 19th century and the early 20th century. This project examines the nationalism period in Iceland as a way of discovering what cultural elements were important enough to be maintained during the development of the now independent nation. It was during this time in Iceland that two forms of musical traditions, Rimor and Tivisonker, which date back to the 14th century, were updated and incorporated into the national music identity in Iceland. Modern Rimor, which can be translated as rhyme and song, is based on the 14th century artistic form that combines poetry and song. Consisting of folklore, epics, and historical sagas, Rimor would be performed in households as a form of entertainment, and it was the performer's job to make these recognized stories compelling. In this style, a performer can use the same melody and different poems that share the same meter. So once you know the melody, you can change the song by simply changing the poem and thus creating a whole new song. This creates many more hours of entertainment for those cold, dark, and isolated days in the villages in Iceland. 
One of the inherent musical traits of Remore is the use of mixed meter, because it accommodates the poetic structure. To allow for better storytelling, the poems would be sung in a chant style um, and would also traditionally be sung with a guttural swallowed sound. However, singing in this style is not common in modern Remore, so you won't hear that today. Another style of music that would eventually be revived in 19th and 20th century is Tifisunker, translating as two-part songs. These songs are similar to the European counterpoint tradition of polyphonic plain song, which is often comprised of a melody and a descant. In Iceland, these were all performed in parallel fourths and fifths to the melody, which would later be seen by the Icelanders as an outdated practice that represented a period of oppression and hardship, meaning the time that they were not an independent country and occupied by Denmark. However, Icelanders would later re-engage with TV Stonker as a tradition that represents their nation's identity, but not without some modifications. The Icelandic composer and conductor, Jón Leifs, lived from 1899 to 1968, and he took it upon himself to develop a new Icelandic music sound by digging up the past and reclaiming those 14th century traditions and putting them in the 20th century. Jón was born at Solheimer Farm in northwestern Iceland, but his family later moved to Reykjavik in 1900. That's when he was about a year old. So much of his formative years were spent in Iceland, and many of his compositions include elements that reflect the extreme weather and landscape in Iceland, vernacular singing styles uh, such as Rimor and Tifisonker, and Scandinavian mythology are all found in his repertoire. Iceland is known for being a country with extremes, such as fire and ice, with amazing volcanoes and glaciers being within miles of each other. It's also situated on the equator, so summer is in Iceland and brings nearly 24 hours of sunlight, whereas the winter brings nearly 24 hours of darkness. It's these extremities that Jón was very familiar with and tried to replicate in his music. Some of his compositions were also inspired by important life events, such as births and deaths of family members. And in many of Jón's songs, you can hear the two-part parallel fourths and fifths represented primarily in the accompaniment. In the first song of Opus 14a, Maun and Lieder, Jón wrote parallel fifths in both hands of the piano, which creates a double-part um, TV song or introduction to the song. The left and the right hand both play parallel fifths, and move to octaves, and then finally conclude with a more traditional TV songer of two voices, one on D and the other on octave A's. You can see that in this slide here. I'll demonstrate the left hand. Now in this slide, you'll see highlighted the right hand part. Let's hear what that sounds like. But then the two hands together, we get that two-part TV songker that I was talking about before. Let's see if you can hear both parts. We also see the use of remore tradition in this song through the changing meter, which do not have a recognizable form and seemingly are used to accommodate just the poetry. You can see on this slide that the, each new thought is at the strong downbeat, and this is achieved by changing the meter instead of adding additional rests or changing the natural rhythm of the text. It's important to note here that all Icelandic words are stressed on the first syllable, regardless of diacritic markings like accents. The three, four measures also makes it feel like you should lean into the first beat, thus accenting the word. For instance, Maunin lither, duiden rither, skukar grauir hljóit yfir hjartsnið sveima. Throughout the remainder of the piece, 
you will hear the piano accompaniment is sparse and paints a very vast sort of empty landscape that replicates the natural landscape of Iceland. The poetry by Johan Jonsson speaks of the moon setting and the snow-crusted earth as a potential for death and rest comes to the living things on the earth. The text for this song translates to, moon passes by, death rides, gray shadows wander silently over snow-crusted earth. It is pleasant to dream about vanished fortune, moon passes by. This is Mount and Lieder by Jon Leifs. Due to its long-standing history in Iceland, Tifisonkr was clearly the strongest candidate to be adopted as a national music. But it needed to be modernized in order for Icelanders to be proud of the living tradition. The tradition of parallel fourths and fifths between the melody and the descant was modified in, to include passing tones and octaves during the 19th century so that it would sound less primitive and thus more acceptable by modern Icelanders. You can hear this in many of Jón's pieces. On this slide, you are seeing Jón's piece, Vude Visa, from Opus 14a, measures 1 through 8. Here you'll see the left hand plays an octave drone on F sharp, while the right hand alternates between major sixth to perfect fourths and fifths as the primary motif. The addition of the major sixth adds a unique color to the repetitive motif, especially in measure 8. Let's hear what that sounds like. Situated on top of this motif, the vocal line often includes jumps of a perfect fifth that resolve to the F sharp, but occasionally the cadence is also is on the fourth, or more surprisingly on the third, which is an A sharp. This A sharp gives a sense of optimism to this lullaby. Aside from the tonal structure of this piece, the reason for its composition is also interesting. As I alluded to earlier, Jón often wrote in reaction to personal events in his life, which is what inspired this next piece. In June of 1929, Jón and his wife Annie and their daughter Snjot moved to Travemund, which is near the Baltic Sea. It is here only five weeks after their second daughter was born that Jón composed Vugevisa, translated to lullaby, Johan Jonsson, a friend of the Jons family, wrote the poem to celebrate the birth, and he suggested to the new father that he set it to music. This song is in the same set as Maun and Lieder, in the poetry translates to, be silent and come to peace. 
Silence spreads over everything. Bowed is the sun into the sea. Sleep thou in blithe peace. We have been awake enough. You shall enjoy safety. Be silent and come to peace. Silence spreads over everything. important to know that Jón spent much of his years composing outside of Iceland, and he composed largely for foreign audiences. After leaving Iceland, Jón studied in the Royal Conservatory of Music in Leipzig, but had a lot of health troubles, and the doctors couldn't quite diagnose his problems, so his studies were often interrupted, and his debilitating illness kept him in bed for many days, sometimes weeks at a time. His relationship with illness and death would haunt him for the rest of his life, and it was also kind of scattered with tragic events. Living in Germany, Jón was surrounded by other composers and music that was intended to represent Germany during the nationalist music period, which inspired him to devote his career to creating an Icelandic music style. He'd already been interested, but now this was his mission. Jón did not see folk music as art music, but he drew inspiration from them to use in his compositions, and he also devoted many years to traveling the countryside of Iceland to collect melodies and remnants of Rimor and Tivisonker through recordings and transcriptions. In 1922, Jón published an article in Skirnir, which discussed what he believed to be the main elements of Icelandic music, which included irregular rhythms, parallel fifths, modal melodies, most frequently Dorian and Lydian, with missing notes, narrow ampetus, meaning a really small range, and recurring motivic patterns. You will hear all of these elements in the pieces presented today. Maybe you already have. Tragedy and death were ever present in Jón's life, so his continuous concerns with death were not unfounded. There were a couple of occasions in Jón's life where he turned to composing songs in response to the death of a family member. It is the death of Jón's father in 1929, the same year as his second daughter was born, that motivated the setting of Opus 12a. 
This includes three songs for voice and piano. The first one is Vertu Gewöd Vater Vater Min, which translates to Be Thou God My Father. Alt eins o blomstrid eina, just like a flower. And up up min saul o sol mit ged, up up my soul and all my spirit. All are set to poetry by Halgrimer Pietersen. Halgrimer Pietersen was an Icelandic poet who lived between 1614 and 1674 and is known for his religious poetry. Before becoming a poet, Halgrimer had been a laborer who abandoned his studies for many different adventures. After working as a laborer, Halgrimer approached the bishop at Skaulholt to inquire about becoming a parson. The bishop decided to ordain Halgrimer in 1644, and this elevated his position in society and gave him the means to no longer live in poverty. At this point in his life, he was known as one of the greatest Christian scholars and poets of his time. During his time in Surbai, he took it upon himself to help the illiterate congregation memorize scriptures by setting them to poetry, which would later become hymns and he also started with the first book of Samuel. Around the age of 50, Halgrimer developed leprosy, and it was during this time that he wrote 50 poems that would later be compiled into a book called Passion Hymns. The first and, second, or first and third poems from Jón's Opus 12a come from the Passion Hymns, and the second poem is a Lutheran-inspired poem written by Halgrimer. The first song in the set, Vertu Gewud Fader Fader Min, comes from a common Icelandic children's prayer and is the 44th psalm in the Passion Hymns. This is an original setting of the well-known hymn that Jón learned as a child, and he had even begun teaching it to his daughter Snjot before composing this song after the death of his father. The poem translates to, Be thou God my Father, in the Savior Jesus' name, May your hand lead me around as I reject all sin. May thy hand, Lord, protect me when the world is against me. And when as thou hurtest me to heaven, I may gladly kiss thy hand. Jón had a good relationship with his parents, which can be seen through the many letters that they exchanged and the amount of financial support that his parents gave him as a struggling composer and conductor. Through the letters he exchanged with his family, we know that he wanted to travel to Reykjavik from Germany to attend his father's funeral, but his family insisted that that wasn't necessary since it would be a financial burden to his family. Instead, Jón wrote this set of songs as a eulogy for his father's death. Jón notes in the score that this song is, quote, best suited to a boy soprano, end quote. But the tessitura and the demands of the music make it appropriate for many singers at different stages in development. This image is showing the perfect fifth motif from Opus 12a that occurs throughout the accompaniment. It sounds like this. This dotted quarter note repetition is reminiscent of church bells ringing, which fits nicely with this religious text. Paired with that, Jón introduces another motif. Um, in the left hand and in the right hand, we hear this uh, leading tones going from a tritone to a perfect fourth. On this slide, I've highlighted the leading tones into the perfect fourth. You will hear this as a repetitive motif throughout the piece to denote the beginning of the next phrase. The right hand sounds like this. tritone here into the perfect fourth. Paired with that, Jón has a perfect fifth in the left hand going to the octave. Together they sound like this. Recurring motivic themes is one of the main elements of Icelandic music 
that Jung identified in 1922 and he uses in his music. This is what makes up the entirety of the accompaniment for the first piece of Jung's Opus 12a. Before I sing the final piece, I think it's important to go over some of the unique sounds that you've been hearing today and that are present in the Icelandic language. These are the sounds that singers are going to need to practice. As I've stated before, the Icelandic language has stress on the first syllable of the word, no matter how many syllables there are, or if there's any accents on the vowels. Accents on the vowels change the pronunciation rather than the length of the vowel. The Icelandic language has 11 vowels and six diphthongs. Unlike German diphthongs, however, which many singers are familiar with, Icelandic diphthongs have a more prominent second vowel, meaning you sing the vowel longer, the second vowel longer than you would in German. All diphthongs in Icelandic close to the E, E, U, and Ö vowel. For example, in the word ro, meaning calm or peace, there's an accent on the O, which makes it a diphthong. Um, and the O moves towards an U vowel in this case. In the song Vugevisa, which you heard earlier, the word is transcribed to be sung for seven beats. So that really draws attention to that diphthong. There's not an exact science to the ratio of the first vowel to the second vowel, but after listening to many Icelandic singers and speakers, I've practiced about two thirds on the first vowel and one third on the second vowel. Singers should be careful though, not to accent the transition from the first vowel into the second vowel. Rather, they should glide into that vowel. So Another sound that is unique to the Icelandic language is the sound of double L's. The double L is transcribed as a TL letter combination in phonetic transcription, but it's pronounced as one sound with the tip of the tongue going to the alveolar ridge, like it's going to pronounce a T, except the air it releases around the tongue on the sides of the tongue, um, which, pronounce, which creates the sound. When pronouncing this, this sound, one should feel a release of air around the sides of the tongue um, but hear a T-like sound. For example, the word psych is spelled with a double L at the end of the word. This is pronounced psych. This sound is, the is in the final song that you'll hear today. There are many rules regarding the pronunciation of Icelandic consonants, so I'm not going to cover all of those today, but they are included in my final project. 
The second piece in the set, in the last song that I'll perform today, Alt Eins O Blomstrid Eina, Just Like a Flower, is the only piece in this project that has an optional second voice part um, composed by Jon Leifs. And this resembles the TV Sonker in the voice part. This is a funeral chorale uh, that is well known in Iceland and consists of 13 verses, but traditionally only the first and the last verse are sung at Lutheran funerals today. Oliver Kentish is someone I've been in contact with at the Information Music Center in Reykjavik, and he explains that the two verses are separated usually by a molten, which is where the pastor places three small amounts of earth on the coffin with the words, from the earth you have come, to the earth you shall return, and from the earth you shall rise up. This is the only song in the set that comes from a transcription of a field recording that Jon made in 1926, and it's an orn ornamented version of this beloved funeral chorale. Musically, this piece is similar to the others discussed so far in its use of contemporary tifisonker and rumor traditions. Throughout the piece, the accompaniment has a bell-like quality through the use of repetitive quarter note ostinato with octave perfect fifths that you see in this image. This we also heard in the piece before this one, Vertugvud Fader Fader Min, but with dotted half notes. Here's what this one sounds like. that includes perfect fourths with a passing third in the right hand that's highlighted in this image. This is similar to the motif that you heard in number one of this opus where a, there was a motif that denoted the beginning of a new phrase. However, this motif denotes the end of each phrase and sounds like this. The rhythmic content of this piece is similar to the songs in Opus 14a, with the new phrase always beginning on the downbeat of each measure. In order to accommodate this, the meter must change, which is contemporary use of the Remor tradition. This method of composing really highlights the poem rather than the music. Storytelling through prose and poem is a life is a long-standing Icelandic tradition that Rumor helps to facilitate through music. The listener is drawn in to the text and the melody helps someone remember the story. I'll conclude today with Jon Leif's second piece from Opus 14a. This poem by Haugrimi Pietersen discusses the fragility of life and the strength that is received through Jesus as one faces death. The poem translates to, just like a flower, it grows up on flat ground, beautifully with pure fertilizer, first in the day's morning hours. In a quick instant, it will soon be shorn off. Its color and leaves decaying, human life passes quickly. I live in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, I die. Although health and life reject me, I am not forgotten. I am not frightened by death. Death I fear not. Neither your strength nor power is valid. By the power of Christ I say, you're welcome to come when you want. <laughs> 